Okay, so I think we'll we'll begin, um, and uh, the other speakers who are trying to join in, hopefully Frank uh, can help them get in uh, in in a few minutes. Uh, so this session is ethics in a troubled, depersonalized world. Uh, joining us uh, we, online right now, we have Tate Nurkin, non-resident fellow, uh, senior fellow with the Atlantic Council, and uh, Brahmish Ananda Chara Swamiji. Uh, spiritual leader and ambassador of peace from India. We'll also be uh, joined, if technology permits, by Klaus uh, Moosmeyer, a member of the executive committee and chief of ethics, risk, and compliance um, for Novartis in Switzerland, uh, David Reiling, chairman and senior executive officer of Sunrise Banks, and Verica Tristanyak, former judge and advocate general of uh, the Court of Justice of the EU. Uh, so hopefully technology will cooperate and they'll be able to join us. So in this session, uh, we will discuss how we don't need to look far to see a world at war with ethics. Evils are justified and good is questioned. Living a congruent life where our highest and ethical and religious values are matched by our words and deeds is stretched to the breaking point. Ethical values have been the foundation for states and religions uh, for eons, providing a bedrock for modern laws. Uh, the globe today is troubled by a pandemic and e increased perceptions of racial suppression and ethical values are being stretched. Can we generalize, can a generalized ethics solve the problem for the world? And what are the philosophical, poli philosophical political, legal, and religious perspectives that may, must be addressed. So first we'll turn uh, to Tate. Again, Tate Nurkin, non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council, uh, speaking to us from uh, North Carolina in the United States. And oh, and I should mention I'm Brian Grimm, moderator, president of the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation. So now over to you, Tate. Great, thanks, Brian. And it's, it's obviously great to be at another one of these remarkable, voracious events. I you know, I come at this topic uh, from a pretty niche perspective, so I'm sure you'll the uh, discussion will expand uh, with our other speakers. But you know, I but I, I do think this perspective is relevant to the overall discussion of um, ethics in a troubled and depersonalized world. I spend my time looking uh, primarily at technology and how it shapes the future of military capabilities and conflict and competition. Uh, geopolitical competition. And you know, it's an interesting time to be in this field. There's a lot going on. All of the technical innovations that we see in the, in the technologies that are driving and shaping the fourth industrial revolution have real, uh, persistent, and powerful consequences for militaries and security communities around the world, particularly in this environment that Brian described. And uh, not just large ones, small ones as well. Uh, especially uh, technologies like artificial technology areas like artificial intelligence and bio and neuroscience and robotics, which are changing the nature of the relationship between people and machines generally, but certainly in military and security contexts. And even in some cases, uh, research is going on to figure out how to fuse the cognitive and physical ability of humans and machines. And in this environment uh, where there is a lot of investment in these types of capabilities, these technologies and the operational concepts of how they might be used in military and security contexts, um, this context has raised what the Department of Defense here in the United States called in a, a report released back in February, new ethical ambiguities and risks. And I suspect for many on this call, um, you know, the, the question is, what sort of ambiguities are there about the use of artificial intelligence and robotics, for example, uh, in a military and security context? The mind and the conversation frequently and rightly goes to very stark uses of these technologies, like, for example, uh, what we call lethal autonomous weapon systems, more commonly known as killer robots. Um, you know, and and there is development of weapon systems that can do these types of things like identify, categorize, track and engage without human intervention, but most militaries and security communities around the world, not all, but most, see this as ethically not just problematic, but uh, have enormous discomfort with this and aren't actively pursuing deployment of these types of capabilities. Um, but even there, there's a little bit of, of ambiguity because some countries are. And more importantly, the applications for AI in particular in military and security settings goes well beyond the starkest examples that you can imagine, right? There are 
uh, a wide range of applications, including some that I would argue uh, could be justified as ethic, ethically salutary, right? So um, AI can enable better decision making. It can help individuals in very stressful environments process more information than they possibly do on their own to make better decisions. It is absolutely uh, critical to the future of simulation and training so that individuals in law enforcement and security and defense are able to diagnose the problems in front of them and act in a more in a way that might diffuse conflict rather than enable it. So the question then is not whether or not these technologies themselves are good or bad. As John F. Kennedy said at the start of the space race period of time, not totally dissimilar to what we're living through now in terms of the advent of uh, technologies. Space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. And, uh, and I think that means the ethical challenge is complicated. It means that it's situational in some respects. It's contextual. It comes down to how is the technology that's being applied developed? Does it have any inherent bias, right? Is it going to produce an, uh, inherently unethical outcomes or unfair outcomes? And how is it applied? And the second question is even more difficult because uh, concepts of what is a, a good and bad application of these technologies in very difficult security and defense contexts, as in all contexts, are going to vary by culture and by ethnicity and by all sorts of variables. So for me, one thing that I've been encouraged by over the last year um, is that there has been a growing amount of interest and research on the ethics uh, within military and security contexts of the deployment of these technologies and development. And indeed, just three weeks ago uh, in Washington, D.C., the United States Department of Defense led a discussion with 12 other nations about, hey, how do we do this in a way that's responsible and ethical and creates trustworthy outcomes? And I think this is all very encouraging, but it, it is only beginning to scratch the surface of the problems that we face in this domain and I think probably apply across across the board that this is a problem of context and requires an awful lot of research to get uh, and, 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 and an awful lot of engagement between nations, between organizations, to have a set of common principles that we can use to determine when is it okay for these technologies to be developed and deployed. Thank you, Tate. Um, we, we've just had uh, David Riling, uh, <laughs> Be able to join us tech, technology wise uh, so David we introduced the others um, so we'll, we'll let you um, go after uh, Brahmish Ananda Chara Swami Swamiji uh, spiritual leader from India and an ambassador for peace uh, so um, we, you know we've heard on the technology side um, uh, could you share some from the religious spiritual side where you think some of the ethics challenges are and a perspective on how we can reestablish them. And you have to take yourself off mute. Sorry. <laughs> Namaste everyone. Uh, Namaste. I'm Swamiji and um, today's topic I'm happy to address in front of all of you. The topic regarding ethics, uh, what I feel is there are uh, some of the major changes we have seen uh, and people are thinking in that way. So uh, in with perspective of religious uh, field or uh, spiritual field, um, we all have to have one point that mindset with regards to spirituality or religious uh, field uh, it has to be addressed in this different way that uh, people should know that religious power or religious uh, people uh, should think that one has to have one uh, faith whoever it may be one person may have his faith in anything. It can be a idol. It can be a thought. It can be a book. He can be follower of anyone. But the thing is, the religious principle, we have to think that spirituality is a core of all the religions in the world. And when we are spiritual, then 
we have to consider we have to think of our behaviors ethics which are already set in the in the minds of people so today i wanted to address that the mindset of all the people in the world has to have new ideas or new changes in their mind so what are those changes i am thinking uh, i have to just uh, count first point is we have to have uh, this god is one it is uh, means hindus are god different and muslims god is different i such like uh, ideas are uh, not uh, correct ideas but they, these are the faith based organization or it is it can be uh, uh, myself i am happy with the thoughts but world level globally we have to think if world has to get prosper with happiness peace with economic power or uh, political power we have to know that an individual person or individual any nation the feeling based or faith based all the uh, temples or organization shouldn't go beyond their limits because one god is enough for all whole world and we have to think that i can pray anyone but already one set goal or ethics tells us that we have to concentrate on only one god which is almighty and supreme who is ruling this world second part i have to uh, come to the my point is we are living with the nature and uh, indian philosophical principles tells us there are four points we have to consider and those four principles we have to think the first principle i have to i am thinking just to address whole world has to concentrate on that point is one is the uh, really, uh, duty we human beings have our own duties to fulfill what are those duties then if i am a indian or i am any nation uh, leading that i have my Uh, compulsory attention towards my nation so that is my duty to upcome uh, bring our nation ahead second duty is mine is i am a human being i am living with the nature i have to protect the environment is my duty so first part human beings has to think that we are living in this world with the nature so first we have to think that i am a part of nature environment and i have to protect environment then only human beings will be happy this pandemic told us that whoever having so much money so much economically strong he might be super power in this world with the money but he can't do anything when it comes to nature so pandemic told us yes we have to think that nature should be always safe and it is our duty so human beings we can't consider that this is white this is black this is some other caste this is something other creed no there is nothing likewise but we are human beings we are a part of nature so racism should get uh, finished with the thought that we are human beings and humanity should be promoted everywhere so this is our duty so likewise duty is the main point first point we have to think or we have to consider after pandemic second point is money or economically we have to be strong how to get those money how to gather nowadays jobs are going some people are getting irritated some people are in more uh, stress tension all these things why these things are in the world because we have focused only one part that is political power and economic power full nations are with the money money and money if we go in one direction then automatically second reaction will come out so money is important without money we can't live but at the same time with the money we have to have faith we have to concentrate for peace harmony etc so second part is money we have to get money in the right source we can't trouble anyone and get money and we live happily no it is not possible for long long time so this is second part we have to concentrate 
then the third part is so we have we are we are human beings we are not animals so like human beings we have to think of next generations these are all ethical points for third point this uh, we are having sexual relationship between uh, man and women it is not simple as we look at it it has, it should be in controlled way it should be in nice way it is not that bad but we uh, human being should know that it is a part of our life we have to think of our next generations so whatever what is in our mind will be with the next generation so having uh, product uh, reproduction we have to think that it should be in right way that is the third part we have to think and last part a person how much he will uh, having wish how much he will earn how much he will think of world one day he has to think of himself and that is he has to leave all the responsibilities one day and think of himself and get connected to the peace these are the four principles told in indian philosophy one is duty second is having money third is having next generation means reproduction and fourth point is living everything and concentrating towards peace these are the ethics the world has to follow and with this i think people will also get attracted towards harmony people will also get attracted towards mankind people will also get attra getting attracted towards environment and such are the principles we need to follow so uh, i conclude now with these four points thank you uh, very broad and uh, comprehensive philosophy one of the things i think that religion does provide um and uh, tate in the first um conversation talking about situational ethics and then now we've moved to more of a universal ethics so looking at the broad picture as well as the uh, specifics so we'll, we'll turn we've also been joined by uh, Verka Tristaniak a former judge and advocate general of the court of justice for the European Union um so we'll come to you uh, Verka in a minute first we'll have um David Riling uh who was able to uh te technologically jump on chairman and chief officer of Sunrise Bank in the US addressing uh, ethical concerns of course uh banking uh, has faced their share uh so we look forward to your perspective uh thank you Brian and greetings everyone um it's wonderful to be with you today and it's an honor to uh have this opportunity and so um it'll be interesting I, i love harassus from the standpoint of the different perspectives and so i'm going to give you a perspective from not only maybe uh uh what you might think of a bank but more of a socially entrepreneurial bank led <laughs> led by an entrepreneur and so uh take that for what it is it might be kind of strange but but here we go um so sunrise banks is a uh us based nationally chartered bank and it has a mission that you might put in that generalized ethics world of doing well by doing good. Our specific mission is to be the most innovative bank empowering financial wellness. And so if I had to boil that down a little bit, so we are a certified B Corp. So think of a triple bottom line company of people, planet, prosperity. We are also a legal benefit corporation. And so in it allows my the directors of the bank to take into account more than shareholder value. It 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 can they can legally look at all stakeholders so including the environment our community and our employees um next we are a certified US Treasury Community Development Financial Institution so boil that down real quick that's a walk the talk meaning over 60% of our loans uh, each and every year are going to go to low and moderate income people or places um and then just lastly to put a global context uh here Sunrise is a member of the Global Alliance of Banking on Value. So 64 of what we would consider the most the world's most sustainable banks. Again, think of people and planet and prosperity. So yes, you have to be financially safe and sound as a regulated financial institution, but also taking uh the social and environmental aspects uh hand in hand along with the sustainability. So these are the people that I hang out with to a certain extent. Now I also hang out with a bunch of entrepreneurs and more specifically social entrepreneurs. And so this 
uh, we're kind of wired a slightly different than I think than most. And so when you boil Sunrise down, it's a very much an intentional and integrated business model. So beginning with its vision, mission, and values, um, that gets baked into its governance model, its policies, procedures, and people. So when we talk about ethics and particularly values, which I think is a close cousin, um, we actually hire and fire based on values and how people are aligned to the values of the company, in addition to obviously the technical skills of the job. But it doesn't mean that as a business, we do anything less. So we measure a lot of things and I'm a big data person. So whether it's quantitative or qualitative, metrics are really important in terms of measuring progress and success. However, they don't tell the story. Um, they're, they're a great place to begin the story and, and, and develop it. But the fact is stories of hope and opportunity really bring out what we consider a success for Sunrise and that's how do you be the best for the world, not the best in the world? And again, stealing another B Corp term there as well. So very much a purpose driven um, philosophy in, in, in company. Now, when I read the title to this uh, to this session, it hit me and in a negative way. So I, I, my, I took a very contrary approach to it. And one of the reasons I wanted to participate was that um, it almost makes you feel that you know, in a depersonalized world, where are our ethics? Um, and, you know, it almost makes you feel like you need to be a victim or be helpless in the situation in the scary times that we live in. And I'm just not that person. And so um, I actually think it's a fantastic time for ethics um, and uh, and a way to express them and find your, your allies uh, to do well and to do good. And so at Sunrise, we have more collaboration and partnership opportunities with technology companies and nonprofits and philanthropic impact investors than we've ever had before. And so it's become really clear as to who are your allies and, and collaborative partners uh, to do good. So in that very kind of positive social entrepreneurial mindset, this, this premise of um, really finding ways to engage in the world. So I, I do think it's a fabulous time in terms of expressing ethics in terms of innovation, change, progress, and disruption. So, and I think as the saying goes, don't waste a good crisis. This is really a great time. So one of the things that, that came out in particular was when we are ethics lacking, and I don't think ethics are lacking, but I do think leadership is, um, particularly in the institutions that we've relied on in the past, whether it be legal or religious or political. Um, I see change happening at such a fast pace, not only in banking, which is being completely disrupted, but in also in, in other industries due to technology. Um, and I think, boy, if the first nine months of 2020 are any indication of the change in this decade, uh, we are in for a change like we've never seen before. And I think the, the institutions that I talked about, the bureaucracies to a certain extent, are having difficulty adapting as quickly as the world is changing. And, and that is one aspect in where I see the folks I hang out with is, is the opportunistic side that there is really great opportunity for positive ethical change to happen. And so I'll leave you with this um, because uh, between my staff and others that I work with, uh, they, they get paralyzed and they're very fearful and they get into that victim or scarcity mindset and I try to pull them out. So I, I developed a quick scary times manual of five quick strategies. So first, focus on others, you know, become a source of clarity, confidence and capabilities for those you can help. Focus on your relationships. Make these times, make your relationships with everyone deeper and more dimensional. Don't think of it as an excuse that, oh, I can't meet you in person. Uh, focus on creating value. Realize there is suddenly a much bigger opportunity to create value for everyone who is important in your life. Fourth, focus on opportunities. So capture sudden opportunities and achieve far bigger future than you ever thought possible. And lastly, focus on progress. Treat every scary time as a special period when you can make the biggest personal and professional progress. So I am obviously very optimistic about the future and how to make change. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and look forward to the questions. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, David. That, uh, that's very encouraging. I, I think you're exactly right in these times of upheaval. 
there are equally times for great innovation for good and, and for new breakthroughs to come through. Um, and uh, so thanks thanks for sharing those principles. Appreciate them a lot. Um, next, we're, we'll be uh, moving to Vera Tristaniak, uh, again, former judge and advocate general of the Court of the European Union, uh, calling in, I think, from Slovenia today. And uh, you'll have to take yourself off mute. There you go. Hello, everybody. So nice to be with you uh, on the online. Uh, I am a Slovenian uh, citizen, but I am based in Vienna, so that um, I am now in Vienna, in Austria, in Europe. <laughs> Um, yeah, I am a lawyer, so that uh, to speak about ethics as a lawyer is a privilege, I would say. Why? Because as a lawyer, I would like to discuss, I would like to stress the relationship between ethics and law. And the question is, either law, legal norm, uh, law norms, limit ethics or ethics limits law. I think that the problem of importance and uh, I would say uh, validity and also of power of ethical norms is is or is still visible during the COVID pandemic crisis. Legal norms, this means law, require compliance with legal norms uh, by imposing a sanctions so that we have set in, in such cases we have sometimes also uh, uh, sanctions as uh, financial sanctions or even prison but i would like to stress that it would be appropriate if ethical as well as moral norms and legal norms overlap this means that if, if we would have two circles, circ, uh, this means that the circles of law and circles of ethics overlap, so that if there are two circles, that they overlap, so that, that the law and the ethic is the same. For example, regarding crimes, if somebody is a murderer, uh, what is legally as a crime has to be morally unacceptable. But sometimes law is, how to say, is uh, smaller, is narrower. Sometimes uh, something, for example, something that is ethically unacceptable, ethically unacceptable, uh, unacceptable is not legally unacceptable or forbidden. I would say, for example, infidelity in a marriage. Hmm? So that this is not... Uh, as a, in law as a sanction. Uh, therefore, I would say we must, we must build on the fact that ethical norms will be the ones that will guide us. This is especially important with regard to our relationship, uh, relationships as a human being. Uh, why? Because uh, Law and legal norms cannot solve all problems. So that ethics is actually something additional and it's very often a correction. We have to respect human rights also for uh, of other people, not to worry only about our own human rights. And this is this where the ethic is actually bigger as a law and this should be also our uh, how to say thank you thank you uh, i don't know if we've um seems like we, we've lost the others tate are you still there i am yes i am I'm, I'm oh you're still here yes mm -hmm. sorry we the screen just lost uh, all of our speakers. Um, they're coming back on. So, uh, Tate, if uh, if I can come back to you, uh, having kicked this this off, and you've heard the other speakers, um, just reflecting on some of your work and the issues that you face uh, working uh, in 
uh, Pacific area, you know, or what can you draw from some of the other perspectives that uh, apply to the work that you're doing? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, and I think um, kind of an in- interesting way to structure this is to start off with what I, I admit is a very um, niche, uh, but, but I think still important perspective on technology and particularly technology's application in defense and security. But I, I think, you know, with the pace of change, uh, particularly in technology, the ability um, to understand, articulate, and apply your core principles remains central. There needs to be some ability to be somewhat f- not flexible in the principles, but flexible in the, in the way you interpret them as technology changes, as environments change. But I think being able to identify, you know, a concern for humanity, right, uh, for the safety and prosperity of humanity as a core principle, even in the military sphere, um, as the well, emotional well-being, all of these things are critical. And fairness is another one of these principles that is being kicked around within uh, security communities as the core principles for how AI should be developed and applied. You know, responsibility, equi- equitability, traceability, reliability, governability, having those at the center of whatever decisions you're taking with the, uh, with the intention of driving outcomes that will benefit, um, as I said, the well-being of others, I think is, is central to what uh, militaries are having to, to, to struggle with today. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I just mentioned I'm part of a group called AI and Faith. Uh, and we've been having some discussions around um, how to apply core principles, as you're saying, to this developing yeah. field. So I think um, a- as this field sort of explodes, uh, maybe the ethics are having to play a little bit of catch up. But that focus on core values and coming back to them makes, uh, I think, gives people a-, a beginning point to address new issues that are coming up. Uh, so thank, thank exactly. you for sharing that. Uh, if I can... Uh, yeah, you want to, Brian? Can I? Sorry, just very quickly. I agree that the ethics has lagged behind the technology and the operational concept development. But I have been encouraged because I think this needs to be an optimistic message. I have been encouraged over the last nine to twelve months that there has been a a recognition that that ethics had to catch up and be uh, action that is now being taken. We're at the beginning. I wouldn't say we're at the end or near it, but um, you have to start somewhere. And I've been impressed by the pace. Uh, uh, and uh, and focus on this issue. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And um, if I can come back to you, David, having hearing what uh, Verica shared about the connection between uh, ethics and law. And so in banking, there's a lot of things that are legal that aren't uh, necessarily ethical. Um, any thoughts you have reflecting on what what she shared? Yes, uh, I, I did. I actually took a couple different things away from the perspective of um, it, it's interesting. You're right. There, there are things in banking that you may consider are legal, um, but as they get interpreted, really, are they truly ethical? Um, and are they ethical a, a bit like when you think of the creation of AI? Does it need a parent? Uh, does it need some oversight? And it does, quite frankly. It's interesting in the world I live, again, a little uh, 180 degrees contrary. In some cases, we are trying to figure out ways in which to work within the law, yet um, through it, uh, responsibly around it, in which to give people more access to financial services, um, whether it's to access to the system, convenience, ease of use and its design. So going back to the laws themselves, sometimes the laws are created in a way that they are biased and and the ethics are not embedded in them as though the creation of AI as well. And so we find ourselves in a lot of when we're trying to serve those who are underserved, we're figuring out ways in which if somebody doesn't have an ID, if someone came from another country who's an immigrant and doesn't have a birth date, the things that are usual markers and identifiers, how else can we identify this person so we can validate and do business and give them access to the financial system of which the law is not recognizing them? So the the law in the body of itself is man-made. And so the fact is it's imperfect in and of itself, whether it's 
for, you know, whether there's ethical behavior by the financial institution or whether it doesn't allow uh, access by others because of its design. Thanks. And I'll come back to Verica on this. Um, I mean, it's a good point. Just because something's legal and coded in law, um, of course, doesn't make it ethical. It might even be unethical. Um, do you have any examples uh, from the European Union of where uh, there have been laws on the books that uh, were unethical that have been changed? Or can you address this topic of when when a law is biased? You know, what do we do in those cases? Uh, I, I couldn't hear the uh, beginning of your question. Is this as for me? No, or for, for you. So, yeah. So the, Sorry, I don't know you were muted. Yeah. Um, could, could you repeat what was the Yes. Question? So the, the, question, um, the question that David was de describing is that sometimes the law itself is biased uh, towards one group or another, and therefore, to be ethical, you have to find some way to either work around the law. Um, so within the European Union, have you experienced any of these situations where uh, there's a law on the books that actually creates ethical problems? And if so, how do you deal with that? Uh, and it would be no difficult to re to how to say to answer with what one example from the European Court of Justice, but in the history we have a lot of such cases. Né? If we uh, in the um, system of um, Second World War there was uh, what uh, the at that time a national system in Germany did. Uh, it was uh, everything was I would say according to the law, but you mm -hmm. know uh, the, the law uh, adopted at that time was not ethical. And this was not a justice, so that after the Second World War, all these laws uh, were uh, uh, annulled and were cancelled, so that uh, this is uh, very often in the history, and this is the uh, task of the judge, is not to read only the law, but to respect also the uh, moral and ethical norms, so that it, the judge today, it's not only, uh, how to say, it's not only reading uh, and it's not only reading the law, but it's only explaining it in the connections with the ethical and moral norms. So that uh, thank you. Uh, there are many such cases when the judge, uh, but maybe also now in the Corona crisis, maybe we will see if the law it's really very narrow. Then uh, the judge, and we will have a lot of cases in the future concerning the Corona crisis, has to respect or has to take in account also. Ethic, uh, ethical and, and uh, moral norms. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time and uh, appreciate all the panelists who uh, spoke and those who attended our session. Um, so if you want to contact any of these, I think through the online, you're able to connect with any of the speakers today. And, um, and I wish everybody a, a good day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.